Hey guys, I'm Chelsea Fagan, and welcome back to The Financial Confessions. Today, I am extremely excited because we have a truly amazing guest who we are all fans of here at TFD. It was a bit of a moment when she came into the office today. She is a New York Times bestselling author, a podcast host, and an all-around wise person when it comes to all things happiness, personality, and the self. You may be most familiar with her four tendencies, which she identified in her New York Times bestselling book with the name, drumroll please, The Four Tendencies. I'm talking, of course, about Gretchen Rubin. And we're going to get into an incredibly fascinating conversation, including talking about the four tendencies, which one you might be, and how to use it to your advantage when it comes to money. But before we talk to Gretchen, I just want to give a quick hello to our amazing partners at The Financial Confessions, our sponsor, Intuit. Intuit makes an entire suite of amazing financial tools that basically act as like a personal CFO in your back pocket. You may have used TurboTax, Mint, QuickBooks, or any of their amazing products to help make your financial life easier, better, smoother, and more efficient, and to be essentially an extra brain that you can keep around you to manage money. I have personally been using Intuit products for years. I use QuickBooks every single day at TFD. TurboTax I've used many times to file my taxes. And Mint was actually the first tool I ever got to get better with money. And you can read more about that in the TFD book. So I could not encourage you more to check out Intuit and all they have to offer. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the products they offer later in the show. But if you cannot wait to get started on your money journey, check out the link in our description or our show notes and learn more about Intuit right now. Hi, Gretchen. Hello. Hi, welcome to TFD. I'm so happy to be talking to you today. I am so happy to be talking to you as well. Um, how was your day today? It's been great so far. You're in New York, but you're over on the Upper East Side, right? I am, and the, the traffic was fine. That's always the big question is crossing the park. It's like, is it going to be hard or is it going to be easy? And it was easy, so it's I a must good day say, in New York. I am a big fan of your apartment. I oh. have uh, looked at many, many photos of it, including as early as this morning, just like scrolling through in prep. Uh, I'd love to to hear a little bit about how you put it together. It's so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, but one of the things, my husband grew up in New York City. And so one of the things he definitely did not want was kind of like the standard boxy New York City apartment. So our apartment's very quirky. It has like, there's a secret room. There's like a secret thing under the stairs you have to like turn around a bookshelf yeah um we will i almost did that but there is a, a like a fake bookshelf which if you pop it open it has shelves inside my the daughter dream. has a thing like harry potter um the room under the stairs um, where she's got a desk and um so and there's a lot of like hidden jokes like there's a um we had a our fireplace faux painted and it has all our initials in it but it looks like kind of marble veins but if you really look at it you can see all of our initials so there's a lot of kind of inside jokes to our family to make it feel whimsical i love whimsy do you like living living on the upper east side i do i love it i do love it you mean because it's kind of boring well no i mean i i live in a boring neighborhood and i love that but Where do you, I, what neighborhood do you live in morningside heights okay um so kind of similar in terms of like you know a lot of big old buildings and you know not a ton of new stuff going on but i feel like the upper east side for a lot of new yorkers is almost like a bit of a mystery mm -hmm. i've read a book i don't know if you've ever read it or heard of it called primates of park avenue oh yeah obsessed with it uh. i'm wondering how accurate you think outsider's perception of the Upper East Side is to the actual experience? Well, you know, that's hard to know because when it is your experience, I think it's hard to know how other people see it because to me, it's just every day. It's like my sister's a TV writer and I'm like, you realize how glamorous it sounds. And she's like, it is the opposite of glamorous. I'm like, and yet to us, it sounds so glamorous. Totally. And, and I think that, so I sort of don't have, to me, it's just like my ordinary day. I think it's hard to kind of know what it's like. I didn't read Primates of Park Avenue because I was like, I don't think that I think it's accurate. It'll just annoy me. But, um, you know, it's just, it's the, it's the, it's everyday life. You know, it's, it's going to the dry cleaners. How long have you been in New York? Almost 20 years. And you were in Kansas City before? I grew up in Kansas City. I lived in D.C. and New Haven in between. But yeah, I'm from Kansas City. What is like in, in terms of your experience in New York, are, are there ways that living in a city like this? Because I also I lived in D.C. as well and I've lived in other cities. And I feel like especially when it comes to your perception of success or your aspirations, there's so much about living in New York that I feel almost like intrinsically motivates you in yes. a way that you never were in other yeah. cities. And yeah. I'm curious how much you think living in New York has been part of your experience of, I mean, I hate to say it, but being obviously so successful. 
Well, the thing that I love about New York versus a place like Washington, D.C. or L.A. or San Francisco is that those are very company towns. And it's like there's one game in town. There's right. the entertainment. There's, you know, the Internet. There's government. And what I love about New York is like there are people that all they do is think about ballet all day long. And all the ballet people, it's like they're all here, too. They're living their lives. And so there's many, many company towns in one place. So I think that's exciting and keeps it feel makes it feel much more vibrant than places that are dominated by one industry where everybody's just basically playing a role in a single giant um, aim. Mm. Um, here, people are trying to do all different kinds of things. And it certainly is exciting um, to be in a place where you think, well, if I want to meet an agent, there'll be a great agent here. You yeah. Know, if I want to have a video course, I could do a great video course here. Like everything's here. Everything's within reach. You can find everything here because it's such a uh, it's such a, you know, um, a gravitational pull to so many people doing so many different things. So I do think that's tremendously exciting. I feel like often when I think about what is has become possible for people that I know in New York and the versions of themselves that they become, mm. I wonder, like, how like what I would have been in uh -huh. another city or what yeah. they would have been and Ooh. how much their personality is is a result of being in this particular city or any city really. Yes. Do you ever wonder who you might have been if you had stayed in any of those other places? Oh, 100 percent. It's so funny that you say that because I actually think about that all the time. I'm like, if I were like a dial, if I were 10 percent more this, what would I be? Um, no, and I often think like, what would it, what would my life be like if I were in Kansas City? Because I love Kansas City. I go back there all the time. It's a wonderful place to live. Um, Missouri or Kansas? Missouri. Oh, good. You know, you're Kansas City. That's a very important question to those Kansas Cityans among us. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I, I think that's a really interesting question. Or you think like, what would I be if I'd gone to a different college where right. it's like, I probably would have had a great experience, but many of my friends would have been different. My trajectory would have been different. My decisions would have been different. It's kind of unknowable. Um, you know, I sort of think that my compulsion to write is so great that at some point it would have found me, but where it would have taken me might have been quite different. Do you think about money a lot? I don't know. You know, money is one of these things that it's so pervasive. It's kind of hard to know if you do think about it a lot or not. I think a lot about it in terms of my research. Hmm. How so? Well, I think in, you know, because I, I write about happiness and habits and human nature. And within that that huge area, I think money is one of the most emotionally charged and complex and difficult for people to grapple with, as I'm sure you know. It's highly emotional. Yeah. It's something where people are drawn to it and repelled by it. Um, mm -hmm. They want it and they are afraid of it and they can't look at it and they can't look away. And it stands for so many things. Money is security. It's an A plus at the top of your report card. It's giving. It's um, it's possibility. It's opportunity. Um, it it can turn into. There's a great Gertrude Stein um, quotation where she says something like, "Money is money," and in the end, people always decide if money is money, and they always decide that money is money. And I'm like, what does it mean that money is money? But money definitely is money. Wow. <laughs> Whatever that means for us. Yeah. What, what do you think it means to you on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, I think some people are kind of upsides and people are more looking at the downside. And for me, money is very important for, for security. Mm -hmm. Like, I like to not have to think about it. Like, I love every time I pay, pay bills, I'm always thinking, oh, I'm so happy I can just pay this bill. I'm so happy I can play this credit card bill, right. you know, right up front. Um, so I love the feeling of security that, that it gives me. I'm not very adventurous. So the idea like, oh, I could go to Tokyo, you know, like right. I don't think about that as much. Whereas I think for some people, money really represents opportunity and possibility much more. Mm. Um, but I also am doing exactly what I want to do. And I think for a lot of people, money represents the freedom to do what you want with your life. And fortunately, I get paid to do exactly what I would be doing for free. Um, and so uh, I don't have to think about money in that way. Which is, you know, something that I never take for granted. It, I mean, it's the biggest privilege probably yes. there is financially. But it's interesting because I feel like what the Upper East Side might be to general New Yorkers, ah. I feel like New York is to most of the rest of the country uh -huh. in the sense that 
it is so expensive or it's money is so prevalent that you almost become numb to the level to which money is a factor uh -huh. in everyday life. And I'm curious if looking around, like even just walking outside your apartment, you ever feel, because I certainly feel, especially if I go to like Soho or something, sometimes just like punched in the face by the amount of just money and luxury and access and things uh, that are all around us constantly. Yeah. I get that way when I walk up and down Madison Avenue sometimes. Mm. Um, yeah, there's a great, who said it? It's like Socrates or somebody had something like, he was like in the marketplace and he said, how, how happy I am about all the things I don't want or something like that. Um, uh, I, I feel that way. Like you watch Succession. I don't know if you watch Succession. It's like, I'm obsessed. yeah, right. Okay. Well, what you see, I mean, what I think it, 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 it illustrates something that people are very aware of and yet always have to be reminded of, which is that money doesn't buy happiness. Right. It doesn't buy happiness. You can be on the fanciest yacht in the world. And if you're fighting with your family, like you don't care you know, about right. how much free orange juice you can get. On the other hand, I think people often are like, well, money doesn't buy happiness. And then they gloss over the idea that money can buy many things that do contribute to happiness Very true. and security or you know, health care or, you know, if your kid wants ballet lessons or you want to get a dog, like all these things. I remember somebody telling me money doesn't matter to me at all. I have a horse. I spent all my money on my horse and money. I don't care about money. I'm like, OK, but here's the thing. You spent your money to buy a horse. And she's like, right. That's why money doesn't matter to me. And I'm like, money matters tremendously. The horse is money. The horse is money. The horse is money. Now, you made a very happy choice and you bought a horse. And um, just like dogs, it's like dogs are expensive. But many people would say it's like what makes me ha nothing makes me happier than my dog. Um, and so and but it's are you choosing wisely? Because right. some things are more likely to contribute to happiness than other things. So buying a bicycle, if you go biking all the time, is going to contribute to your happiness. If you buy a bike and leave it in the garage all the time, that's not going to add to your happiness because right. it's just a foolish choice. It's like a fantasy self or like knives. Like a friend of mine bought like a super fancy set of knives. <laughs> she cooks all the time. So for her, it's like a joy. Beautiful toys, tools make work a joy. But for somebody who just has them to sit on the counter, it's like create the impression that he cooks. Right. That's not going to add to your happiness. That's just like an empty show. Or like, you know, you go gambling. It's like maybe it's super fun and it's like, you know, you're going with your best friends from college and it's a whole experience and like you you lose a thousand bucks and it's fine. Or maybe you, maybe you have a real gambling problem and you know, gambling is the worst possible thing you could do. So a lot of it is, are you making wise choices? What are you spending your money on? Money is just, it's just something that can be used. It can be used wisely or unwisely. I often feel like, because I'm sure we're all pretty familiar, especially our audience with the the studies around at what point there's okay. diminishing returns. I don't believe that. You don't. Can I, can I, can I take that on? Bust that. Okay. Yes. Throat. So there is research <laughs> that suggests that after $75,000, it's, right. it's very, that's just not true. I'm just saying here, like, no, I did not run a an experiment myself at Stanford mm. on a bunch of undergraduates. I'm just here to say that's obviously not true. We know that's not true. We can sit here right now just talking amongst ourselves. And we know that's not true because $75,000 in North Platte, Nebraska, where my parents grew up, is a totally different life right. from $75,000 in Manhattan. Right. And $75,000, if you've got six kids and one special needs, is very different if you live in a studio apartment with your pet turtle. And $75,000 is very different if you love um, to travel. And $75,000 is very different if you, I mean, if you have celiac. I mean, there's a million reasons why $75,000 represents one thing to one person and it's completely different from another person because people's circumstances are so different. I mean, it's just like the idea that you could pick. That's like saying the best height for a person to be is five foot five. And you're like, who says compared right. to what? Right. What do I want from life? If I want to be a jockey on a horse, what if I want to be a basketball star? What if right. I'm going to, what if I'm going to, yeah, I mean, it just it's a nonsensical number. Now, you could say that there's some kind of average, but it's like, what right. is the average? But they don't present this as like the this is the average. They say after seventy five thousand dollars, it's diminishing returns. And that's just not true. Well, I think I mean, so I obviously live in New York as well. And so f uh, very much in my own life, seventy five thousand dollars is not the number. Right. But I do believe that at a certain point, for whatever that definition may be to you, and maybe we could say you know, comfortably middle class to upper middle class in your zip code or whatever it may be. I feel like there is a point, at least anecdotally, where more money is not necessarily going to have a It goes pretty high. I don't think the research actually goes that high because what happens is that money starts to buy convenience. Right. And time. Right. So convenience and time really contribute to, okay, so 
let's say you travel all the time for work. Sure. And now you have money to fly private. How much happier is that going to make you? It's well, going to make you quite a bit happier. That's a lot of money. Boundary there, There's but. a lot of money. <laughs> There's a lot of money. But would it make you happier? Would if somebody was was looking at you one to ten scale day after day after day, you'd probably get a boost. But now you might say, well, that's totally illegitimate, or mm. that's a far that's a far fetched number. But the idea that that people aren't experiencing gains. I'm just not convinced. Now, is it diminishing 100%? Like, is that going to flatten out? Absolutely. Because at the bottom, every little increment matters tremendously. I mean, if you go, I mean, it, because that's the thing about money. It's like health. When you have enough, whatever, like you say, enough would be, mm. um, you start taking it for granted. Having, you're much more aware of what you lack than what you have. So if you don't have your health, you're, you're obsessed with getting your health. If you don't have enough money to pay the bills to ba to get the, the basics of life, then that's overwhelmingly important. And as you have more and more and more that you have, it becomes it becomes less and less of a gain. Would you at what point do you stop seeing? And then people make bad decisions like having more money means people can make more spectacularly bad decisions, mm. which they sometimes do. Well, what's fascinating, but people though, who are poor make spectacularly bad decisions as well. Very we don't, true. We don't tie those. But like when we talk about um, despair, what mm. people, you know, it's like, OK, well, is that a you know, that's and it, that could be a money could, could be conceived of as a money related issue as well. What I do find interesting, though, is you mentioned that a lot of money buying, among other things, time, which yeah. is true. Yeah. And but, convenience. And convenience. But in America, for example, like our highest earners tend to work the most yeah. hours. Isn't so they're that not, fascinating? But they're, so they're is, not buying themselves time. Isn't that time. fascinating? But that is absolutely fascinating. This is very unusual in the history of the world. I agree. That the people who have the most money are working so hard. Right. And that's, and So yeah. it's not that they're lazy, right? It's no. not that they're decadent. I think it's that work is fun. And when you're working at a very high level, it's really fun. See, I, it's, it's, I it's really fun. It's 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 almost compulsively fun. It's it's there's an enormous there's all the, the you know, you're getting that intermittent reinforcement of getting things done. And 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 as you I mean, for in many jobs, the more senior you are, the more interesting your job is. I would say that's probably true for a lot of people. I do think that there are two factors that are incredibly important for most people. One is lifestyle inflation. And that is sort of like the hamster wheel that most people, even at a middle class salary, can't get off. But also, I would say secondly, and this is particularly true for you know top executives, top earners, the people who are in these rooms, is an extremely limited pool of peers against which to compare yourself. So you combine this idea of lifestyle inflation with first class used to be enough. Now it's, you know, executive first class, the like private suite. Now it's a private plane and all of the rest of that that used to be great feels unsatisfactory. And then you combine that with you live in a building where everyone else in your building is a millionaire. But see, I don't think that people are working to make more money necessarily. I think they're working for the satisfaction that comes from the satisfactions of work and part of the satisfactions of work is money money is money and people want more money if they can have more money but there's so many other things like when people say like oh these people are clearly greedy because they have more money than they could ever spend and yet they continue to work around the clock it's not because it's because they want other things you know what about because, status oh 100 percent status enormously important enormously important but many people have high status that don't make a lot of money but in a lot of places the way that you indicate that you have a lot of status is the money is the grade it's the grade, it's the gold star, it's the measuring stick. Mm. And could we all go off that measuring stick and have like an imaginary me you know, measuring stick where it's like literally a star chart that, you know, Warren Buffett distributes at the end of the year? Probably, you know, that would probably keep people driving just as much. Is there a point at which a person could earn too much money? Oh, well, that's a very interesting question, right? If so, we've clearly reached it. I would agree, but I think the question becomes at what point is it our obligation as a community and as a society to say, hey, once we get to the point where Jeff Bezos can cheat on his wife and lose the value of the, you know, the entire GDP of the country of Bulgaria because he made that personal error and there's that much wealth in the hands of what is at the end of the day of, of you know, a human being with flaws and needs and insecurities and right. 
at the end of the day, also a rather selfish interest compared to what an entire community of people would do with that same money. Do we want that level of power in, in individuals' hands? And if not, like, where do we draw that line? And and how do we draw that line? And I'm curious because well, obviously- that's a social, I think that's a social question and a political question, not an in, a question of individual happiness. But I think that it also starts- in our perception, right? Because I think that we still very much valorize these people. We still very much look at the metric of success through a lens of money as maybe not the most valid one, but still, I mean, I love watching Shark Tank as much as anyone else does. And that is, I think, speaks so highly to our cultural understanding of money as if not the most important arbiter of success, at the very least, the most true one or the most clear one. But I don't know. I, I'm not sure that I agree with that because I think there are many people who are very, very highly respected, who are very, um, who people are very interested in, who don't earn a ton of money. Like, I, I don't know why I keep talking about the ballet because like I never go to the ballet. But anyway, um, <laughs> but like someone who is, you know, a, a ballet star. Mm. Um, I think everyone would be interested in that person. Or like, I'm a writer. There's many writers. You don't make that much money writing. Most people don't make that much money. There's other people where, you know, people would be like, oh my gosh, Robert Caro, he's here. Oh, let's like, they would be, they would be very, very excited about that. And they would be very interested in him and they would hold him to the very highest respect, but not because he earns the most money. I mean, I'm sure as a writer, he does make a lot of money. I'm sure because his books are so, are so respected and successful, but not compared to like a hedge fund guy. Right. Um, but it doesn't really matter because we're not, because that's not, if you work in finance, then that's the big metric. But then there are many, many other metrics where people are very interested in just your accomplishments in another way. Um, mm. well, and most people try to translate their accomplishments into money because that's how they make their money. That's how they, that's how they support themselves. Mm. Um, but, um, but I, but I, I don't think it's the only, I think it's, it's almost, it's it's it is it's an accompaniment, but it's not necessarily the only driver that's important or like a very great doctor. You right. Know, if somebody was like, you are the preeminent cancer researcher in the United States, people would have enormous respect for that person. Right. Um, and and be extremely interested in basically probably anything they had to say on any subject because they'd be like, wow, this person, like what an accomplishment that must be. What an important role to play. in so Nobel Prize winner. Friend of mine's husband just won the Nobel Prize. How crazy is that? Congrats to that Right. Man. I mean, it's crazy, <laughs> right? It's yeah. Like, he won the darn Nobel Prize. That's a very, very, very big deal. We hear every day, all day from people who have a very difficult time decoupling their identity from how much money yes, they make. Yes, that's very true. And yes, I don't want to minimize that. That's an outs that's a very, very, very astute point. Well, and I think also it's, you know, Jeff Bezos is obviously such an extreme example. And yes. I think, you know, it's it's easy. He's the to, most extreme example. Literally or the no, most. number two, right? I was going to say, think after that incident keep, with his wife, yeah, not, yeah, not quite as much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he got knocked off. But, um, yeah. but I do think that He's doing okay. the way that we look at people like this or the way that we'll treat people um, who have reached f such high levels of financial ex success has such a direct link to people making that own that connection in their own lives. But see, I'm not sure that's true because because what uh, what the research suggests to a very great degree is that we compare ourselves to the people who are closest to us. So the average person walking around New York is not thinking like, oh my gosh, what about the person who lives at 720 Park? They're not even aware of that person. That person's like an imagine. It's, they're like a shark take person. They're 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 a figure on succession. They're not real. What they're looking at is the people in their neighborhood. For instance, research shows that if you are you're much happier being one of the wealthiest people in your neighborhood than one of the least wealthy people in your neighbor neighborhood. How much ever, however affluent your your neighborhood is, it has to do with your peer group. And people, they, they, they um, compare themselves to their peers, their age peers, like how am I doing in comparison to the people I went to high school with or the people I went to college with? And then how am I doing to the people who are around me? So I think that people are much more influenced by kind of a couple rungs up and down than they are by things like images on TV. Like, what about the people on their Instagram feed? Um, I, you know, that's that's an interesting question. But I, it's it, it's funny to me because to me, it just feels like watching dynasty or something like that really? it feels like i don't feel but i'm not that focused on instagram um and so and i'm also kind of an underbuyer type of person like I don't, I don't i'm not particularly and then some people there is an aspect of uh personality called social comparison mm. some people just are very much more apt to have social like they're they kind of are inclined towards social comparison 
and feel bad when they feel like they don't compare well. And obviously, if you are a person who scores high in social comparison, basically social media is your nightmare because it's just a vehicle for social comparison. Whereas like, I don't think I score very high in social comparison. I feel like nobody ever really notices me and I don't really ever, I'm so distracted. I never notice anybody else. So I feel like that that doesn't clue into me, not even really because of values, but I feel like just because my makeup, it doesn't sort of strike a chord with me in a way that causes me anxiety. But clearly it does. I think you're pointing to something that many people have, have said that but I, you can always turn off Instagram. I'm like, hey, man, mm, stop, you following, can, stop for sure. following these people. Well, you like, could, if they're making... but I think a lot of people have a very, very difficult... I think it's, for a lot of people, a borderline compulsion or addiction. Well, it's it, technology is a great servant and a bad master. And it's like, if you feel bad every time you look at someone's Instagram feed, then delete... You don't, you don't have to get off of Instagram altogether. You can take off... So you don't have to... You can unfollow one person. It's right. like, I think we have to recognize that we are not passive recipients of messages. I had to do that. I had to unfollow everyone I didn't know in real life who oh. made me feel bad. I still occasionally it leaks in and there's it does ways leak to in. stop. It but does leak in. It, it does it, leak in. That's true. I could probably put a real number on and how it helped like my depression. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it does. But I think I think what is fundamentally so different about social media and I think obviously if, if you're able to opt out of it on a personal level, like I would love to know your secrets, but because I think well, if I'm able to, I mean, one is able to do it. One may not totally choose able. to do it, but or, a person yeah. can do it or find it difficult to do it. But I think for the, what's interesting to me is how much something like an Instagram feed has opened up this window in people's lives that you're no longer quite just looking at your next door neighbor, but you're also not looking at someone who is explicitly a celebrity or a, see, a right. TV star, Jeff Bezos, yeah, 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 or yeah, someone yeah, who's yeah, so yeah, far yeah, out yeah, of your realm. Yeah, who feels almost imaginary at that point. Right. And, yeah. and it, and it, so it feels like that, that it, it feels like someone you could know at work in a lot of ways. Whereas, mm -hmm. the, you know, in many cases, like for example, the, the vast majority of young women, cause our audience is like almost, I think it's like 92% women. They follow us, but they also follow many uh, influencers, bloggers, sure. writers, things yeah. like that. And these people to them feel on many levels like someone that you know, um, but are right. still living this vastly, vastly different life. Um, and as we mentioned it earlier, whether it's a horse so or a wardrobe, yeah. all of these things yeah. that they're presenting to you at yeah. some level are money. Yeah. Um, well, and it's interesting because all, although we all intellectually know that we're getting kind of a curated um, snapshot that doesn't represent the truth, it's very hard to remember that. Like you forget how much you're not seeing, even though intellectually, you know, I'm not seeing 99.9% .9 of this person's life. Um, and all kinds of stuff should be could be going on that I don't know about. It's it is hard to remember that when you're looking at Absolutely. it's like a picture is worth a thousand words, and it is hard to remember like you know. And it's funny because if you know people in real life and you see this, you, you know how much is not being pictured. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah you can yeah. just like crop out the frame. Even, even Laura Ingalls Wilder, um, who I revere, um, said, "I told the truth, but not the whole truth." Mm. So if you've been thinking about deleting some of those apps that are terrible for you and maybe putting a better one on your phone. And if you have your own business or you're managing a side hustle or have different streams of income, one of the best tools you can give yourself is QuickBooks. As I mentioned, I literally use QuickBooks basically every day because without it, I would be wholly incapable of managing TFD's finances. QuickBooks gives you an easy to read dashboard that has all of the ins and outs of your company's financial health right in front of you so you can go through them exactly as you need to. They'll help you do everything from get your invoices paid on time to catalog all of your expenses so that when tax time comes, it's not the biggest nightmare of your life, which it very much has been for me pre-QuickBooks, to making sure you're totally on top of everything coming in and going out of your business. And if you think you need to own an incredibly impressive company like I do in order to use QuickBooks, just a reminder that it's also extremely helpful for people who are, for example, freelance. If you're freelancing, even just for your side job, you are essentially a company of one. So get the best possible tool for managing your company's finances with QuickBooks. We'll link you to more info in the description in the show notes so you can get started. Uh, so I'm obviously, so I love personally when I talk to people and I think that we have a very different approach to not just kind of the the management of your own identity, your own sort of uh, control over to what extent you feel 
maybe defined or not defined by other people. And something that I've always thought looking at your work is that you seem very in control of how you perceive yourself or how you mm. define yourself. Mm. I personally still very feel very out of control of that to a large Ooh, extent. In what sense? What a fascinating observation. Well, well, for example, I had mentioned earlier that a lot of our audience has a very difficult time separating their personal identity from the amount of money that they make sure. or have. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't happen to be mine. But I definitely feel that in other ways, like, for example, my professional sense of identity or satisfaction is extremely dependent on other people, even people that I don't work with, like my own family members, like to what extent they think I'm, you know, my job is real. Right, Stuff right, like right. That. Oh, Working right. on the internet, it's even yeah, more yeah, yeah, complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what's a podcast? Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. yeah. We've all, we've it, all totally. heard that. Yeah. But I feel like I, I'm curious how you have, and maybe it's just a perception that you don't feel as accurate, but how you've managed in your own life to make sure that you're sort of the locus of not only your self-worth and identity, but also these outside factors. Like to your point, a writer doesn't make probably as much money as a lot of people think they do, but whether or not you're making, you know, a ton of money or you're on the bestseller list, as you said, you would be a writer regardless. Yes. And I'm curious what are strategies that you've found to to really center those feelings in yourself and those senses of identity? Well, I think one thing, it is really helpful to kind of know what you want. And it sounds like what could be easier than to know what you want. You just hang out with yourself all day long. What do you want? Um, but it's actually, I think, very, very difficult because a lot of times we're swayed by what we think we should want or what other people want us to want or or what we wish we would want, you know, and, um, you know, I started out as a lawyer basically for all the wrong reasons. You know, it's a good education. I'm good at research and writing. My dad's a really happy lawyer. I can always change my mind later. It's a great preparation. So I went and I had a great experience in law. You know, I ended up clerking for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Like, so I don't regret any of it. It was all great. Um, but I went there for a very default. I just went because I couldn't think of it. I just didn't know what else to do with myself. It was, I did not mindfully go. I didn't choose to go. But then when, with writing, it was like I was seized with the desire to write a book, a particular book, which ended up being my first book. And so I just felt so certain because I knew this was what I wanted. And I think, you know, some people really do have that. It, like even, I mean, doctors feel this way. I, I met a physical therapist who felt this way. Uh, I was reading that I went to like one of these like fancy artsy circuses, like my family, for some reason, we go to artsy circuses and you read the like the playbill and it's clear that people feel compelled to like become jugglers. That sounds funny, but it's really true. People feel like this enormous. They're like, I ran, I literally ran away to join the circus at age 15 because I couldn't help myself. I just felt so drawn to the circus. And so um, I feel like maybe that made my sense of identity easier because uh, because that was just such like an overwhelming thing. And then I was able to to do that. I think sometimes people feel this compulsion, but then for whatever reason, they're not able to follow it. Do you feel that having had that career as a lawyer, which was obviously not a fit after a time, made it easier to feel so certain in your mm -hmm. identity as a writer with or without you know, maybe the more traditional success. I think what it gave me was it gave me a sense of confidence in myself. Right. And and, and I wrote a book called The Four Tendencies and it's all about this personality. Oh, framework. I know. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, whether people are upholders, questioners, obligers, or rebels. And we'll get into all that. But one of the things, I'm an upholder in this framework. And one of the things about upholders is they're really good at meeting outer expectations and they're really good at meeting right. inner expectations. And I'm a person who can really keep promises to myself. Mm. Um, I can rely on myself. I can rely on myself more than I can rely on anybody else in my life. And what I realized is that most people don't feel that way. They don't 100% feel like they can True. rely on themselves. And I feel like law was really, really hard. I did a lot of things that were really, really hard to do. And I did them. And because I was like, I'm going to do it. And I did it. And so I was like, I am going to go to the bookstore and buy a book called like how to write and sell your nonfiction proposal. And I will just follow the directions because I don't know what else to do. And so I did. Oh my God. You know, and, then it, and then it worked. You know what I mean? <laughs> but great. I was like, I am the kind. But so what I knew was I didn't know if I could get an agent. I right. didn't know if I could sell a book. I didn't know if anybody would pay me to write a book. All I knew is I want to write this book. I'll do it for free because I want to do it so badly. And I know that I can write a book and follow the instructions and see what happens and hope for the best. And that's what I did. What do you, what would you say to advise people who 
like many people, feel incredibly defined by their financial status or their compensation, or even who more in my case feel very defined by external validations of, you know, professionalism or success or what have you. Like what outside of that sense of preparedness, if for example, they're not an upholder and right. they can't trust themselves right, to like right. get yeah, the yeah, like yeah, how yeah, to yeah, get yeah, a book yeah, deal yeah. and get it. Oh, but see, if they know their tendencies, then I can tell them how to do that. Well, how would a like, rebel do it? How would a rebel well so rebel it's inter interesting. Wait, can I take a minute and just talk about the word, like just define them? Okay. Yes. So oh, that's I will a good idea. Okay. I assume I want to know what familiar. you are. I think I know what you are. But... Oh, please guess. Okay. okay. Given your career, I was like, I would think she would be a rebel because it's such a rebel career path. Right. Okay. But I, I had gotten two different answers, I think, and I mm. remember she had corrected me, ah. uh, my partner who's in the room, to be like, no, no, this is the answer you. Yeah. A lot of times, got. if you ask her for help, to other people are like, oh no, yeah, that's that's cl very clear. You can take the. It's like a free quick quiz. Two million people have taken the quiz at quiz rubin.com you can take the quiz very short very easy but but most people know what they are right away so uh if i just describe it so it has to do with how you respond to expectations outer expectations and inner expectations so outer expectations are things like a work deadline inner expectations are like i want to keep a new year's resolution for myself so upholders as i said readily meet outer and inner expectations so they meet the work deadline they keep the new year's resolution without much fuss so it's very easy for an upholder to do something like, well, I'm going to work my full time job and on the side, I'm going to write a book like that's like, OK, that's that comes easily. And, and as I said, our motto is discipline is my freedom. Questioners question all expectations. They'll do something if they think it makes sense. Mm. So they resist anything arbitrary or inefficient or unjustified. They always want to know why um, once. So they're making everything an inner expectation. If it meets their inner, expe inner expectation, they'll do it. No problem. But if it fails their inner expectation, they will push back. So their motto is, I'll comply if you convince me why. Mm. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but struggle to meet inner expectations. So like a person who says, oh, when I, you know, when I exercise with a friend, I would never miss it. But when I'm trying to do it on my own, I struggle because it's like, well, when the friend is expecting you to show up, you would never let them down. But when you're trying right. to go on your own, it's hard. Um, and so if obligers want to meet an inner expectation, what they need is outer accountability. Right. You want to read more, join a book group. And so their their motto is you can count on me and I'm counting on you to count on me. Mm -hmm. And then rebels, rebels <laughs> resist outer and inner expectations like they want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they want to do. They can do anything they choose to do. But if someone asks or tells them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And typically, they don't like to tell themselves what to do. Like, they don't sign up for a 10 a.m. spin class on Saturday because they're like, I just want to wake up on Saturday and see what I feel like doing. Maybe I'll do spin class. Maybe I'll do yoga. Who knows? Mm. Uh, maybe I'll go to the farmer's market. Um, and so their motto is, you can't make me and neither can I. I do remember that. By the way, this is like watching like Michael Jackson perform Thriller or something. Oh, it's yeah, like yeah. we get to hear the four <laughs> tendencies from Gretchen herself. This is exciting. Oh um, I will never stop talking about that. So rebels resist outer and inner expectations. Right. So they want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. Um, so for them, it's about identity. I'm a writer. What does a writer do? A writer writes. Like, no one can tell me what to do. I'm a writer. Or it's like, I am a leader. Mm. I'm a leader. I've always been a leader since the time I was in third, third grade. I'm a leader. Like, I'm going to walk into this place and you watch me. I'm going to lead this place because I have the heart of a leader or whatever it is. It's like some rebels want to make a lot of money and they'll like figure out how to do that. Or some rebels are like, I want every day to be different. So I'm going to get a job where I'm like, uh, I manage a chain of restaurants and every day is different. And I'm driving around and nobody knows where I am at any particular time. Like they, they do it with their identity because that's what they want. That's what they choose. Strangely, a lot of rebels are also, um, as I said, the subgroup of rebels are uh, attracted to areas of high regulation, mm. like the the military, the clergy, the police, and large corporations with lots of rules. They kind of need to know the rules so that they can push against the rules. That's a certain kind of rebel too. Do you feel that your tendency as an upholder in some ways liberates you, oh, for example, 100%. with money? <laughs> See, this is the thing. People look at upholders and think that we, because we do, because we're constantly like crossing things off the to-do list and sticking to our calendars, they think that we feel constrained and trapped. Mm. And in fact, we feel incredibly free. And the motto of the upholder is discipline is my freedom. And we don't understand why other people don't don't perceive us as free because we feel very free. No, but the fun, the interesting thing about your team is that when rebels pair up in, in work or in romance, almost always they team up with obligers. That is mm. by far the overwhelming. So if you have two people on your team who are rebels, I would say 
probably a lot of the other ones are going to be obligers because you're going to need to have obligers to kind of work with those rebels. Two rebels together yeah. as a team could could struggle. Yeah, I, I I definitely think that that's true. And I I'm personally like I I think that it's difficult for a lot of people to really narrowly define themselves as either a questioner or an obliger in the sense that I think that like a lot of people have a little bit of examples of each in their life in terms of like specific things that yes. other people being present for or outside expectations like really helping. Um, and it's interesting because we talk on TFD a lot about accountability being an incredibly powerful tool for money, um, not necessarily because it really fits with people's personality types, but because it's so infrequently taught talked about and because it's so taboo ah, and ah. so personal. So it's almost the surfacing of the issue. And and not making people feel so isolated in mm -hmm. it. Whereas yeah. it, for, for most people, you yes. could have like a, a group chat going about literally any topic, including like sex and dating and yes. things that are superficially more taboo, but you'll never talk with your friends about your salary. Well, who wrote that? Um, it was a writer, Neil. Uh, he wrote a book, a, an article in the Atlantic about like basically being a middle class person who was totally failing at money and all the mistakes he'd made. And mm. it was explosive. Right. Because he was like explicitly talking about like, I drained my retirement account to pay for my daughter's wedding. And like <laughs> we, you know, like just talking about all these mistakes he made. And it's like you never see that. Right. Like, somebody really talking about the decisions they made, why oh, they totally. made them and, and what they regret. And I think you're right. Like just talking about it helps to sort of drain out some of the, um, the electricity, the negative electricity around it. So to, to the point of lifestyle inflation. So I think, you know, again, I think for a lot of people that constant, that like Chinese water torture of constant small improvements in mm -hmm. life and conveniences. Yes make the idea of decoupling one's identity and happiness from money incredibly hard on a practical level. I will say your earlier point, I'm very fascinated that you push back so strongly on the $75,000 number, mm -hmm. which I think is true on an obviously like very practical level, like living in New York City, that's right. not a lot of money. But I also think that it's probably more than anything driven by that and it's not inherently a bad thing. And to your point, it's not a new thing, this lifestyle inflation. But that happiness continually rising with the income or at least the net worth is probably heavily tied to that concept of lifestyle inflation mm -hmm. because you now redefine happiness on slightly better terms every yes. day. Yes. Well, and it's, 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 that's called the hedonic treadmill. So it's like, what? you know. Oh, the hedon it, 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 got yeah, it. <laughs> hedonic treadmill. Because it's like, if you've never had air conditioning before and you have air conditioning, you're like, this is the greatest invention of all time. Totally. But now we take it for granted. Like, we're not like walking around excited every day that we have air conditioning or like, you know, the elevator, you know, right. it's like, I live on the fifth floor. Oh my gosh. If I didn't have an elevator, I would be very, very sad. But you know, I don't, exactly. I don't have a gratitude practice for my elevator though I should. Um, but I think one of the things that a, a person, the way you can do this maybe, and uh, to your point that um, the... Uh, that this lifestyle inflation can kind of get get us on this treadmill of spending more and more without getting, you know, because we just feel like we're, our standards are constantly rising, is that what people really want is an atmosphere of growth. Mm. They want to feel like things are moving in the right direction. They want a feeling of progress. They want a feeling of of growth. But growth comes in many ways. And so, like, right. if you learn something, that is a feeling of growth. And so if you're like, you know what, my, I can't make my apartment any better, but I'm going to get better at watercolor, that would be very exciting and satisfying to you. Um, or you're like, you know, I am going to, I know this little teeny tiny nonprofit and they are just a hot mess when it comes to their finances. I'm just, I'm an accountant. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to clean it up for them, get them going. That would give you a tremendous sense of growth. Teaching people to do things, fixing, learning. These are ways of having growth. And so I think if people feel stagnant when they feel that they need growth, I think they often go to money because money is easy. Money is like, if I buy a new pair of black boots, I'm going to feel great. If I get a new dining room table, it will like make my whole apartment feel better. If I get a washing machine, I will. it'll be so great. Now, and on one hand, it's great. If you have a dining room table, you can entertain more and maybe that'll make you happier. Or the washing machine will save you a ton of time and it'll be convenient and that could be great. But if you need, need that feeling of growth, money isn't the only way to get it. You could think of like, how can I learn something? How can I teach something? How can I, maybe you get a dog and you're like, this dog is going to bring this whole new element into my life. It's going to give me a tremendous sense of growth because there's going to be so much change and new stuff and 
I'm like, I'm going to go to whole, I'm going to go to new, you know, I'm just going to go to new places. Like, right. I never knew about the dog park. I go to the dog park every day. You know what I mean? There's all kinds of ways to get growth. I think you're right that money is the, it's kind of the most straightforward way. You, you can just go out and buy it, but there's other things to do. You mentioned earlier the address 720 park. I'm curious if you've seen the documentary 720 park. No. So I highly recommend it both okay. to you and the audience because it's one of the most salient examples of lifestyle inflation, just like a very sort of clear cut. It's it's heavily about how the most expensive address in New York, 720 Park, and it's just like a, you it's know. It's kind a, of an iconic. It's exactly. sort of invoked. It's, I don't, it probably now is not the most, actually the most expensive address. But, probably not. It's but probably it's the icon. Or it's something. like yeah. the one that you use. To totally. And it's expensive. all full of just like billionaires. And uh, and it's also part of the documentary is about how it's like under a mile from the poorest zip code in the country. So mm -hmm. it's also about income inequality. That's New York City. Absolutely. But the fascinating thing about the men primarily in 720 Park and also the women, but it's primarily the, the men who are the earners in the building, um, have essentially entered into this incredible microcosm where their sense of competition, of success, of having enough is so narrowly defined that, for example, they will fight each other on terms we cannot even imagine to move up one floor because it's considered prestigious to be on a higher floor. Mm. Someone will bring in 50, mm -hmm. you know, fir trees flown in from, you know, Hungary for Christmas. And then the next year, someone will bring in 65. Um, and so they've essentially reduced their world down to the most unbelievably luxurious possible definitions. And you realize in, in sort of learning a little bit more about these people li people's lives that it's entirely decoupled from, to your point, anything that they would do something with or would make them happy on a practical level, it's entirely redefined by their position uh, amongst each other. But mm -hmm. I think it's just fascinating how, you know, you can look at that and say like, well, that's such an extreme example. But what about when you move into a slightly better building where now suddenly everyone's decorating their front door for all the holidays mm -hmm. and you never considered doing that before. Mm -hmm. But now you're like, I got to go to TJ Maxx yeah. and get a million glittery right. pumpkins, yes. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Highly recommend. That right. <laughs> well, it's one of these things where we are social creatures and we take our cues from the people around us. And... Um, so we are very influenced by what other people, the people around us, what they do. Would you say that as a as a last question on this note, that the best, if there is a shorthand or litmus test, the best litmus test to the, the worthiness, the intrinsic worthiness of a purchase that may often be influenced by external factors is what you are actually going to practically do with that thing or how much you are going to use it or how much it's going to actually change or enhance your your day to day life? Yeah, I think I think that's that's a good I'm thinking about whether that's yes. Right, because and it really depends because like you could buy um an expensive laptop and if it's like you're like me where I'm like my laptop is like my comfort object and it's like I carry it with me all the time mm -hmm. it's like that's a great investment. Right. But for somebody else it's like why you know you're right. just this for you is just it's just conspicuous consumption it's just you want to have the fancy thing you don't really need it like you're not going to get a gain from that. You can just keep your use your same old laptop. Um or thinking about um It's interesting though because there is there is something about purchase for some people. I don't think that there's enough talked about what happens at the moment of purchase. Oh yes. I I have a bad feeling of purchase. Oh really? I do. I always feel like I'm always like I would like to not purchase this. I always like an underbuyer. So there's underbuyers and overbuyers and mm. underbuyers tend to like not like to purchase. Right. But it's still a moment of power for me because it's like I feel like am I going to regret it? Like I often have anticipatory shopper's remorse and I have to force myself to buy something that I need. I mean, I'm not talking about buying like a mailing envelope, right. but like, you know, a shirt. There's a bit of a four tendencies equivalent in the personal finance world in the name Ooh. of, yeah, the name of the man is escaping me, but Ooh. we can Google it. But uh, yeah. the, there's like one of the personality types is avoidant. Yes. Uh, one of them is sort oh, of- Oh, yes, 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 yes. It's I've a man, I can't remember his name. Yes, I felt oh, that. Oh, Ryan, yeah. that's yeah. why we have a producer. <laughs> no, I've, I've read that too. Yeah, I and love like, categories. I love I loved these distinctions because I do same. think it's- So, because I think part of it is that people have different challenges because some yeah. people are like always overbuying and they have right. to hold back i almost have to force myself to purchase right because i'm like i need stuff and if i just wait it's just going to get more complicated you know mm. do you have it dr uh brad klontz 
Yes. And one of them, so one of them is like avoidant. Uh, and that often has to do with just like, you know, the people who don't like to look at their bank account, just like swipe the debit card and hope it works. But then there's also people, and I don't remember his exact term for it. A master of avoider, hoarder, money monk. Yeah, so it's oh, this spender. is money. This is this is, mo- this yeah. is money. This is entirely about personal finance. About but there money. there's yeah. essentially That's a, a type one. where people romanticize and fetishize and almost have like a love feeling toward the act of purchasing oh. um and the act of of spending. You know, spender is obviously the name of the type, but it's mm-hmm. it goes so much further than just sort of compulsive spending. But so here's something fascinating that somebody needs to think about at great length. Maybe me, maybe you. <laughs> Maybe we'll find all these. So I was talking about I was talking about the question of like impulse buying and how mm. do you how do you control impulse buying if this is a challenge for you? Mm. And a number of people wrote to me and said that what they do is they will fill their cart and they will have so much fun filling their cart and then they abandon their cart and they never had any intention to purchase, but for them the fun was the choosing. Right. And that was the fun for them, which was I would choose this and I would buy this and I would use and I would buy these shoes. And that's the fun part for them. And so then also, I think, do stores realize that, you know, they're very focused on unfulfilled orders. A lot of these people maybe don't ever had never intended to fulfill their order. They were just shopping for the fun of of choosing. So then I'm like, that's interesting to me because that's not even purchase. Right. So you could say there's like choice and kind of the identity or like the 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 the, the kind of the the mavenness that comes from choosing then there's purchase then there's acquisition which is i have a bag and i'm bringing it home mm-hmm. there's display yeah there's use there's experience i mean there's like it's like it's not one thing it's many many things and people are like activated at different points right like why this i, I mean this is why you i mean you live and breathe this stuff why it's so emotionally complicated because Absolutely. people can be wigging out at all different places. Oh, yeah. And for for me, at least, because I've always battled with that my whole life, it's mostly just being able to imagine a different version of yourself um, and all that will go with it. Uh, and so for me, like the number of times that like making a Pinterest board yeah. has saved me from making there, a terrible yes, purchase. Yes, because it gives you the feeling of identity and kind of claim. Yeah, it. and you can, and it's half of the fun is just imagining and half of the fun See, to is- to me, that's so- exhausting. Oh my gosh. That's the part I, I want to skip is the oh, choosing. No. I don't like the choosing. I literally go to open houses of apartments for fun, like in my spare time, just because I love just like imagining what I would do in the apartment. And it's, well, I mean, luckily with an apartment, I can't move into a right, new right, one right, every right. three weeks, oh, but I wish there was that for clothes. No, no, but somebody, somebody <laughs> said that to me that she would go to beautiful stores, very expensive stores where she couldn't buy anything because then she said there was no question of purchase. It was clearly all too expensive, but it was just right. the joy of looking and choosing. Totally. And she said the thing about a beautiful store is like, you can actually touch the things right you know for people who are very tactile it's not like a museum where it's like all behind a rope and you can only look it's like you can feel the fabrics you can pick up the candlestick whatever and she said for her it was just the but it had to be a very expensive store because mm-hmm. otherwise she might be tempted to purchase totally but she went to a store like you, you go to an you, you have fun with an apartment because there's no way you could buy it exactly so you know you're not you don't have to fight that temptation that's also me and jonathan adler like whenever i scoot over to the upper east side i'm like oh i'm gonna go into john jonathan adler and touch all the beautiful lamps i can't buy oh, well, one of the stores closed the one at eight, if you went to the one no. at 84th and madison it's gone. oh my god the one, devastated the one in the 60s is still there but the one or no the, no it's the one on the west side no the, yeah, one the west on the, side one closed that is heartbreaking the upper east side jonathan adler like yeah. going there and then getting a cookie at dean and deluco oh, was yeah. like my little imaginary I, day i know exactly ah. i probably walked down the street so with my sad. dog right behind you oh well yeah, it's closed so this Dina has been De- Dina DeLuca close too. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, that's depressing, but I feel like that was a long time coming for you the Dean to Greenbergs. DeLuca. Go get a cookie at Greenbergs. Ooh. They're still there. Hot tip from our Hot tip. resident Upper East Side. Get a black and white cookie from Greenbergs. Um, so we do have, I'm pulling them up. Uh, wait, where did they go? Lightning round. Lightning round. As long as I can uh, actually get them. Number one, what is the big financial secret of your industry? Mm. I think for writers... Um, probably more for nonfiction writers, it's having an email list because this is a way that you can have direct connection with your readers and more and more as everything becomes more noisy and more fragmented and there's more and more things competing for people's attention, having an email list is a way that you can really connect with your readers directly. And so more, I think that's like, that's a big thing to have. It's a big asset to have. It takes a long time. So it's it's not not something that it's, and it's not something you can go out and buy. But it costs money to maintain it and to use it, make use of it. But I think it's really a, a great 
a great investment of time and energy. Do you get the Gretchen Rubin emails? Oh, that's good. Sweet. Yes, what? sign up for my newsletter. Yeah, <laughs> yes. GretchenRubin.com <laughs> slash hashtag newsletter. Yes, I know it's weird. Slash, slash hashtag. hashtag newsletter. It's not good, but there it is. What am I going to do? You, <laughs> I'm sure we can get a web can, developer. You can manage it. It'll you be can, in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Just click the link below. Um, what do you invest in versus what are you cheap about? I'm cheap about food. I don't really care about food. I love <gasps> diner food, that kind of thing. Ooh. But I am I really do spend money on tools. Like like what kind? Like, um, I, um, like laptop, my desktop, my headphones. Um, when I, I like have this amazing it guy who comes all the time to make sure mm. everything's backed up. I'm like, I live in fear of things not being backed up. I'm not very technical. So, you know, he's like, you need it. You should get a, this account or that account and back everything up or do this. I'm like, what? what? Yes. <laughs> I will pay for anything. That's like a tool. Got it. Good one. Comes in handy. What has been your best investment and why? My best investment is, you know, I don't, I, is the people that I work with, like, mm -hmm. you know, what I pay, what I feel good about paying. I don't nickel and dime when mm -hmm. people are like, what about this? What about that? Um, I think it's like working with people who are never saying like, it's more important to me to like eke the last dollar out of something rather than work team, with them. Out of curiosity. Um, you know, do I have a team? I have like people that I collaborate with kind of, Got it. um, I, you know, it's kind of like I, and I have so many different identities. Like I have people that I work with for podcasting, but then right. they're not involved on the writing side. I do work with somebody, um, with a lot of kind of social media type stuff mm -hmm. who like helps me with format the newsletter and cue things up in, you know, time shifting and, you know, reminds me like you're on, you're doing a live event with your sister, do an Instagram story. Don't forget. I get very distracted and I forget. So, you know, she helps me with just staying on task. What has been your biggest money mistake and why? Oh, I know it's obvious. My biggest money mistake is a big money mistake that I bet many, 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 many people will say, which is that I don't, keep enough of like a budget and knowing like where's all my money coming from and mm. what am I spending money on like I just have a general feeling that there's enough money for me to like manage everything but I'm not like sitting down and thinking like oh I have a video course what did I make this year from the video course and like what did the video course cost to make and like what's the ROI and oh I spent this much oh I, I spent this much on my newsletter because you know you've got to have you got to I thought on convert kit and like what did it cost me what does it cost me to have a newsletter mm. I should know that you or should, I should know that <laughs> and I don't know that that's my big money mistake because I don't wow. I'm not in in fact I always have a one on the happier podcast. We always have a one word theme for the year. And I almost made my theme metrics because I definitely <laughs> need metrics. And I'm like, I don't want that to be my one word theme of the year because I don't want to work on my metrics. Does it make you anxious? It doesn't make me anxious, but it's it's a rookie error. It's dumb. Mm. I should know ROI. I should know where my where, what I'm spending on and what I'm gaining. It's, it's not enough. To, I mean, I have enough people sort of involved one way or another that I'm not going I'm not going wildly off the rails, but I should have a better sense of like how things do. Is you that know? the same for your personal budget? Or yeah. just your business? It's mostly my business. Okay. So like personal stuff, you're more on the ball. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. At least there's that. Yeah. Well, also with personal, it's not as confusing with like things costing money, but also making money, but then mm. there's hidden costs. And then you got to think about this. And you got to think about that. I mean, it's more like, yeah, it just feels more straightforward. It's right. like, I'm buying this and it like costs that. Right. Whereas a lot, we're in business. I feel like a lot of it is like, you've got to get into like, what's worth it and what's, what's worth it it's yeah. the time it's the energy it's the money it's other people's time their time if we you know, if, if, if we're working on this we're not working on that opportunity costs you know i'm a writer so anything that takes my attention it's like oh but i could be writing my next book right um so i feel like there's like it's a multi-factor thing which doesn't mean that i shouldn't be doing it right it's just not so straightforward and so that's so that i think but i think even just saying this to you right now, I'm like, ooh, maybe 2020 should be my year of metrics. I I, I support that, obviously. Okay. But I do think it's funny. We get a lot of, we talk to a lot of people who are pure creative types in our universe. And a lot of times they will be people who have an extremely avoidant relationship to money, particularly when it comes to business, often for a lot of the same reasons. And so they're sort of inevitably surrounded by, you know, vultures essentially like people who yeah. really take advantage of the fact that these people don't want to think about their finances and i recently heard a creative say that like 
when I was asking her about how she manages like, you know, all of her finances, she she doesn't touch them. She has people that do all of that for her. And I was like, oof, you at least have to get like a copy and make sure that you're going through it line by line because a lot of these people are essentially going to be paying out of the nose for something they didn't know could have been free to them because the person is right. then adding like a consulting fee oh, and then they're adding, you know, right. their surcharge. Yes, yes. And, and so I, I always get very wary of people who have offshored that to someone yes. completely outside of their own No, that's scope. a very good point. Well, I feel lucky because I have an agent. I'm very close to my agent. I'm in very close contact with my agent. So I feel like in so, insofar as there's supervision, like right. she's highly supervised. But on the other hand, like I think one thing that's difficult for a lot of people is what do you price? What do you charge? Right. And one of the great things about having agents is like they are charging the most they can and right. you're not, you don't have to do that. I feel very bad for people who are still in the position or like in their industry, they have to price their own work. That's clearly, that's a very, very difficult thing for people to do. Um, and it's nice because agents like they, what they, they're paid for is to negotiate and also to know kind of what is the market? Mm. What will the market bear? Right. And to make sure that you get what the market will bear. I fully support a metric journey next year. A metric journey. I like that. Gretchen's metric journey. <laughs> a financial diet story. Um, what is your biggest current money insecurity? Probably related to that. My right? metrics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck am I spending my money on and what am I making my money on? I just throw spaghetti against the wall. That's the fun part for me. I get you. Nice. But you're right. I got to get some metrics. Yeah, no. Oof. Metrics, man. Okay. Metrics. ROI. What has been the financial habit that has helped you the most? Paying all my bills without paying interest. Just paying. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Compound interest, man. It's, it's, it's your best friend or your no, worst enemy. I mean, it goes both ways. It really does. It really does. It really does. <laughs> and as a last question, when did you first feel successful? And I'm putting air quotes around that for listeners. And what does that word mean to you? Well, it's interesting that we were just talking about agents because... Putting this on my law career, which was kind of like a completely different arc. Um, but if I say as a writer, when did I feel like a success? The first glimmer of success as a writer mm. was when I got an agent. Mm. So I hadn't written a book and I hadn't published a book. I didn't have a book contract. But there's a lot of people wandering around writing screenplays, writing novels, writing books. But when I had it and I felt kind of like, who am I just like sitting at a coffee shop writing? But when I had an agent, I felt like. For an agent, their time is their money. Right. And this person is saying, I am giving you my time. Mm. I'm investing in you. Totally. Because I think that you can go the distance. And for me, of everything that happened, I think that was the moment that was the most exciting where I was like, this has changed everything about my sense of myself. Because I'm like, it's it just got real. It just got real. That's wonderful. I have an agent. And it's the same agent you still Same work with agent. Today. We started out like she says, baby agent. She was a baby agent. Oh. We started out together. I just was emailing. I emailed with her this morning, you know. And so that was a very, that was a very, I don't know that I would say it was, it was, it was a moment. It was a profound moment of feeling like, okay. Yeah. It was one. I, I have same. I've been with the same agent uh, for like a decade. And yeah. He like when we started out, he was at this teeny tiny yes. little agency. He went yeah. through a few different. Now he's at CAA. And yeah. it's like hard to get him on the phone. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> like, oh, man. He's doing it. Dream. I love I it. Feel, that's so great. It's yes. wonderful. Well, that's one of the things too, to remember that when you're starting out is you may be starting out with somebody else who's just starting out. And totally. at the time you can feel like, well, this is a death knell because how am I going to get anywhere with somebody who's like barely been in this industry longer than I have? But it may be the best, like the love connection and you rise to get, my sister always says people succeed in groups oh, and, that's great. um, you know, it can be, it can be great to come together through the, through the, through experience. Well, thank you so much for coming. This has really provoked so many thoughts for oh, me. Oh, this is so, I feel like we could talk all day I long. Know. Like, I how know. are we going to stop? Well, open invitation. We'd love to continue the conversation. And um, where should people go to listen or read or anything more of you? So at GretchenRubin.com is kind of the hub of everything. So you can get the podcast there, or you can go to your favorite podcast app and listen to Happier with Gretchen Rubin. I do a lot of posts there about my adventures and happiness and good habits. You can take the quiz there, quiz.gretchenrubin.com. We'll take you straight there. You can find it on the on the website. Uh, you can sign up for my newsletter, um, gretchenrubin.com slash hashtag newsletter. I've got a bunch of news. I have a quote newsletter if you love beautiful quotations. Ooh. 
um, or it's just my general newsletter. And um, yeah, but so if you go to the website, GretchenRubin.com, that's kind of where you can poke around and find more than you ever. <laughs> Discussion guides, one pagers, like all kinds of stuff there. Are there pictures of your beautiful apartment? There are pictures. Oh my gosh. There's pictures. There's pictures of my dog, Barnaby. Yes. Too. Uh, yes, there are pictures of my apartment. That high gloss powder room is very much like on my oh good right now. love oh, a high gloss powder room. Oh, you sound very advanced. Well, I'm just like I'm I'm moving into a new apartment, but I'm very much all about people making very bold choices, Ooh. and a super high gloss Ooh. paint is like I'm trying. It to is, your, go and it's there. a tiny, tiny room, and so it really. But I love like, that. Yeah, no, with a tiny room, you can kind of do more than you can like because you can really do something that mm. kind of would be too much. No, but it totally works. Yeah, well, good. Wow. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gretchen. It was lovely to spend the, the afternoon with you. I love getting the chance to talk to you. So coming on the heels of that incredibly inspiring and motivating conversation, I feel like it's time to do something that is extremely upholder and get control over our finances. I use QuickBooks every single day at TFD to manage every element of the company's finances, and I cannot tell you guys enough how much it saves my life. One perfect example of that, which happened literally like four hours ago, no less, is that I had to pull up a specific amount of exactly what we paid this one person like months ago. And because I had QuickBooks, all I had to do was literally go to the part of QuickBooks where it has all the people you've paid, type in their name, and voila, I have every payment history of that person that has ever transpired. Now, when I tell you that I used to do the same thing by digging through my bank account statements, what may not come through is that you only have searchable bank account statements for like a couple months at most, and then you actually have to go to like the PDF versions of the bank account statements and physically go through with your own eyeballs to try and find things. Suffice it to say, QuickBooks has made that entire process vastly easier. And one of the biggest things with any company is making sure you know exactly who you're paying and who's paying you. If you've ever frankly wondered about either of those things, you should check out QuickBooks. And you can do that at the link in our description and our show notes. So thank you guys so much for tuning in to yet another, if I say so myself, fantastic financial confessions. And please, of course, reach out to us on social, on our site, by Carrier Pigeon, however you want to get in contact to let us know more of who you want to see financially confess and what you want to see them financially confess about. See you next week. Mm -hmm.